Welcome back to the YouTube home for BamaOnline.com. Travis Ryer, Senior Analyst for POL, alongside Senior Team Writer Charlie Potter. It is a Tuesday, March the 5th, 2024. Charlie, we've got plenty to talk about. We've got Kalen DeBoer's post-Monday press conference, post-practice press conference on Monday that we'll get into. We'll go to the other side of the ball. We had our offensive player draft last week. I won that handily. I think we both <laughs> agree on that. Looking to do the same on the defensive side of the ball this week. And then we'll continue to preview a big men's basketball game down in Gainesville tonight, 6 p.m. Central tip-off. Alabama travels to Exact Tech Arena to take on the fighting Gators of the University of Florida. So no shortage of topics, Charlie. No, it's a busy time of year. Um, you know, November is usually kind of that spot where uh, you start to you know, catch your breath a little bit. And it's tough to catch your breath whenever everything's happening. But March is uh, the time where you, you're kind of conditioned for this. We've been through the fourth quarter program now, <laughs> like Alabama has been through. So, uh, you know, it, it's a fun time of year, though. It feels like it's taken – two years to get to this point, this first post-practice press conference for Kalen DeBoer. But no, we were we were here, we made it through, and and now we're looking forward to getting out of practice later this week. Charlie Potter posted up in the Naylor Stone media suite on Monday evening for DeBoer's post-practice media opportunity. Uh, we talked about this a little bit before we went on here. Was it kind of other than, by the way, the fact that the guy that's been behind that mic for the last 17 years not being in that position on Monday, was it, but was it in other ways, kind of procedural, kind of what you're used to seeing in your 10 plus years of doing this? Yeah, as business as usual. Um, I think going into it, we had the expectation it might be a little different. Um, you know, DeBoer went, I think, 15 minutes. Uh, you're, you rarely saw a 15 minute Nick Saban press conference. He, he had other things to do, but I think Kalen will be, for lack of a better word, more gracious with his time. Um, but I, I do think it was very similar. Um, we didn't have the water bottle uh, warning from Cedric. I know people no, have mentioned that uh, wow. on the uh, on the round table, but you know, Cedric's still around. And he's still in that staff directory that was updated yesterday too. So um, you know he hasn't gone anywhere yet. But for the most part, um, it was a, a crowded room as one would expect. Uh, I'm sure that'll die down as the spring progresses and your regulars will be in there more. But um, for the most part, yeah, it was uh, outside of the man behind the lectern there. It was pretty much business as usual for Alabama. You know, intentional is a word we hear from Kalen DeBoer quite a bit. We heard it again a couple of times during Monday's press conference. Charlie, kind of brings to mind Saban's why we do it, how we do it, and why it's important to do it that way when mm -hmm. I hear – Kalen DeBoer talk about how things are done, how things are organized, how things are carried out. And we get so caught up in position battles and who's going to step forward, who's going to adjust, how they're going to adapt to the talent that they've inherited and brought in since taking over from Nick Saban with Kalen DeBoer and this staff. But uh, intentionality, I guess, is a word. And it also has to do with staying healthy, something we probably don't talk about enough, but Really, if you list the to-do list for spring practice, it is certainly where your top 40 guys are concerned right there at the top, I got to think. No doubt. Yeah, he mentioned that a couple of times, just the way that they do things, the way we, the way they protect each other. Um, that's a, a big focal point this spring. And I don't think that was something that Nick Saban and the previous staff overlooked by any stretch of the imagination. But you can see with Kalen DeBoer, you know, these practices are important, but you need those guys to be healthy uh, come uh, September, October, November. So I think there is that intentionality from that standpoint. And, you know, guys are, are learning um, a new way of doing things. I'm sure the practice schedule was different for them. It sounds like at the beginning of practice, a little different. The end of practice is different. I'm sure where things are set up are different. So there's just a, a learning process for the players, but it sounds like, you know, they've got them prepared. They've kind of done some mock things to get ready for it. And, um, you know, for the most part, I don't think he's going to come up here and just, uh, you know, gripe and moan on the first day of practice. But he sounded pretty pleased with uh, the execution, the transitions. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it was uh, I think for the most part, when you kind of look at his body language and the way that he answered things, I think Kalen DeBoer is pretty happy with how things went on day one. 
And there we see Kalen DeBoer as we get into some of his comments from Monday. There is the Coke bottle. There is the water bottle. There is not Nick Saban back there. So a little bit of an adjustment post-practice, but something that isn't an adjustment is Charlie Potter getting a question off during the Q&A. And before we get into spring practice too much, I thought it was a good thing that you brought up the fourth quarter program and how it sort of translated from the Nick Saban era into the Kalen DeBoer era. And here's how that question and answer went. Hey coach. Um, I want to ask you, go back a little bit and ask you about the fourth quarter program. Just what were your impressions of that? And maybe did you add any wrinkles or tweak that at all? No, we kept it pretty consistent with what it's been. And uh, the guys, you know, you can tell it's something that they really feel strong about um, the energy uh, just is there, uh, you know, from the beginning to the end. And I think the key is right is, is taking that in the, in the, in the workouts when we're in these the early winter months here and transferring that over to football. And, um, that was the challenge today. We have, uh, a period at the end where we gather and, and, uh, we've referred to it. Uh, I've done this many years now refer to it as also the finish or fourth quarter period and uh you know being able to connect to what they just did the last uh few weeks uh with the fourth quarter program um you know it's transferring it from the indoor and the workouts that they're doing onto the football field um i think that excites them and you know there's been a lot of football games won because of the the work that's been put in because of that program and uh you know they believe in it um you know, and it's going to be important for us uh, this fall for sure. Interesting, I thought, about a finishing period to practice, Charlie, literally called the fourth quarter period. I'm going to guess that's probably not the funnest period of practice. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't sound like it. Um, but no, I mean, I, I know people have a million questions going into these press conferences, uh, but after the first day of practice, I'm not going to ask him about an individual or a position group. He's still learning these kids' names uh, to some degree. But I think it's important, like, when you look at what he's done over the last couple months in not only bringing in his own culture and system, he's also been smart about retaining the things that have worked well. And I think everybody from inside the program, around the program to outside the program has heard about the fourth quarter program and the importance of that and, and how it's led to success on the field. And I think Kalen's been smart in the fact that he has embraced the things that he knows the players feel work that they feel comfortable with, and they might not enjoy it in February going through those drills on the field. But um, I think that once they get to October, November in the schedule, they can look back and, and realize the impact of those. So I, I think that, um, him embracing that, not really tweaking it much is important, but it's also interesting to hear that they kind of implement that into practice. There's some carryover. And while I'm sure the, the players don't enjoy that, like we just said, um, I think this will be beneficial, you know, come the season. I think it's coaching savvy 101. It is a stretch that is anything but glamorous. Right. You know, we all see these guys on fall Saturdays and think, wow, the glamour, the glitz, the pageantry, as we've been told so many times about college football. But the reality is the price is paid from January through July and through August mm -hmm. into fall camp. And to really empower the players in an area that isn't their favorite, to give them ownership in some form or fashion of that stretch you almost have to do that because your fate in a lot of ways is in the hands of your players. Now you've got a strength and conditioning staff. You've got a support staff. Now, as we know, there's armies of support staffs around college football these days, but a lot of it from January through July is on the players. And so I like it from that perspective. We also, Charlie, uh, got a question about Keon Sab, the Michigan transfer and we'll listen to the response to that question from Kalen DeBoer, and then we'll give a few thoughts on it. You had a chance to bring in uh, Keon Sab recently. What uh, about him was attractive about bringing him in? And also, what kind of role do you envision for a guy like that? Yeah, I mean, we're, you, you know, you bring a guy like him in um, to, to be an impact player for you. And uh, his experiences, um, you know, not just – you know, each and every play, but also the experiences and leadership that uh, as he's here longer and longer that we would expect from him um, because of, you know, the, the level uh, that he took his team to um, winning a championship. Um, 
you know, that, that, that fits in well with what we're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to do. And just the, the character makeup, uh, aside from, of course, what we know is a, a great football player. Um, he just is a really good fit for us. It's been a pleasure getting to know him more and more each and every day. Um, just seeing how he's operating and, you know, right now he's just going about his work. Um, uh, but you can tell he's got that, that, that it factor. He's got the, the leadership piece, uh, within him, uh, to where I know we'll be counting on him this fall. Wow. I guess is the initial reaction to that response. Now, obviously you go to the transfer portal at a big time need area like safety. So you expect that a guy like Keon Sab would jump right in and be a factor from day one. But I guess this is also a little bit of a difference too, right? From Nick Saban to Kalen DeBoer, it was more unspoken under Nick that you went to the portal, you brought in a Tyler Steen, you were plugging and playing with him at left tackle. And, and that's fine. But I think it's encouraging. And at the same time, a little bit different to hear Kalen talk about Keon Sab in those terms. No, there were a couple of forthcoming comments that were refreshing. Uh, I don't think Saban necessarily hit anything, but he's also not a guy that's going to come out and and uh, you know, give away his hand immediately. And I don't think Kalen did this uh, that much either. Um, but I do think that, you know, words like impact player, it factor, the fit that he is with with Alabama uh, really stuck out. And I do think, though, you know, we, we've heard it before from Nick Saban with, with certain guys. You know, I, I don't know if Keon Sab is going to be like an all-time favorite uh, yet. I think he very well could be. I think he's an exceptional player that can make a big impact for this team. But, you know, I think back to um, – when Nick Saban was first asked about J.K. Scott, and uh, I think he said, well, have you seen him punt? Like, there, there are moments whenever a guy comes in and you just know that he's going to be a dude for you. And so um, I think Keon Sab can be that. And, you know, it's the, the, like you said, going and getting a transfer is different than bringing in a true freshman who comes in and opens eyes immediately, kind of like Caleb Downs did last year. I know that's probably a, a sore subject. But, you know, Keon coming in, helps make up for that loss of Caleb Downs. He brings experience from a team that's not only won a national championship, but play well against Kalen DeBoer's offense. So, yeah, I mean, it's not surprising to hear him kind of shower him with praise, but um, it, it is a situation where I, I think we're probably going to hear more of that from Kalen throughout the spring. Yeah, and if we were wondering about the quarterback situation, right, and how that was going to look, on day one, Kalen pretty much laid that out for you in his response to a question as it relates to competition uh, moving forward for Alabama under his direction. Coach, kind of touched on that. You talk about depth chart and different stuff. Obviously, I'm not asked for a depth chart, but you have players. I mean, you sat next to Jalen Miller at the basketball game. Is that your guy going into it, or do you clean slate every year with every position? Yeah, I mean, you want competition, right? And so um, the competition is always going to be there. And, yeah, someone had to take the first reps today, you know, with uh, with uh, the ones uh, when we lined up and we referred to him as that, and Jalen did, you know. So, um, you know, he's putting everything into it he can, along with the other guys that uh, took those first reps. But I fully expect uh, those guys that are really hungry uh, to be pushing um, those guys that are ahead of them uh, to be their best, and uh, that's what you want in a football program. Uh, you know, and that's that certainly going to be the case here with so many good football players here uh, wanting to get on the football field. There you go, Charlie. I thought that was handled wisely when you talk about being clear that obviously you expected Jalen Milrow to take that opening snap of spring practice, but then also, you know, encouraging and inviting uh, competition, not just at quarterback, but across the board. No, I think that's kind of an interesting element of this whole thing is just what does that initial depth chart look like? Because you do have a lot of holdovers from last year's team, uh, but you are you have new players you brought in that you think can make an immediate impact. We just talked about Keon Sab. You know, he's been here a couple of weeks. Um, so it, it's a situation where I think the ones, the first group, the guys that are going through practice first, that's going to change over the course of the spring as the staff kind of starts to evaluate and, you know, dissect what's happened on the field. But yeah, it, it was no surprise that Jalen was going to take the first reps of the first spring practice. I think he takes the first reps of the first preseason practice and the first reps of the first game. Uh, but I do think that competition is going to be important, not only at quarterback, but everywhere. And, uh, you know, I, I think the way he handled that, that was a that was kind of a, a Nick Saban answer, even though I don't think Nick Saban 
would have liked that question at all. <laughs> I don't think that question gets asked in that capacity with saving behind the lectern there. I, I think uh, you have a day one spring blow up of sorts. <laughs> but I, I do think, though, you know, with the way that Kalen handled that and, and the way that he kind of talked about the, the rest of the guys, too, uh, it's going to be interesting to follow at every position throughout the spring. Yeah, I think that question would have elicited a look to the right by yep. Nick, yep. as we saw before, <laughs> and maybe some responses to questions. And it's a fair question, I think, yeah. uh, and one that you obviously want to put out there in terms of the quarterback position, because it does shape up to be a very strong area for this football team. And there are some changes, certainly, in how Alabama will go about its business on offense and you know how Jalen projects in that offense and you know his continued improvement in some areas where he's going to need to make sure that is the case. We also heard some talk about the green dot communication that's coming yeah. into play. Charlie, I thought that was interesting because, you know, it's been proposed that teams can also use tablets in games. So, so much of this trickle down from the national football league, right? We see it in the NFL, the green dot is the player on offense and defense that's signified by a green dot on his helmet that represents the communicator on the field from the coaching staff on the sideline and Alabama is wasting no time. It sounds like going ahead and getting acclimated to that communication. Although it was kind of funny to hear Kalen talk about uh, maybe supply issues right now, because so many colleges are looking to uh, take on that technology. Yeah. It sounds like a couple of quarterbacks were able to utilize it. I'll be interested to see which two quarterbacks maybe, or maybe they switched helmets. I don't know. But uh, I'm sure Jalen Milrow was one of them. And, you know, he didn't have any really f real feedback from it yet, fresh off the practice field. You know, that's something we can ask him later in the spring, just how is that coming along. But I think it's it's kind of um, overdue for, for college sports, for football especially. Um, I, I think that that makes too much sense. When you have the issues that you had this past year with sign stealing being a problem still, um, the fact that you don't have that in-helmet communication is kind of laughable, I think. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's a – I hate to keep bringing it up, but it's a very Nick Saban thing to do. First day of spring practice, we have something that has been proposed but not yet approved. It's expected to be, but not yet approved. Uh, we're already working with it. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a, the preparation, the on top of things, um, you know, kind of tells you what to expect from a guy like Kalen DeBoer and this staff. And I'm sure as soon as they can get more of those, um, you know, helmet communicators, they're going to have them out there on the practice field, both for, you know, the quarterbacks and probably guys like Deontay Lawson and those inside linebackers. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch and see how that plays out. And uh, we've got another practice coming up on Wednesday. We will have a media viewing period on Wednesday, Charlie. So a lot of folks excited about that one. You're going to have some defensive representation post-practice. So a lot you're going to want to hang in there with us at BamaOnline.com to take in in the coming days as Alabama spring practice underway under first-year head coach Kalen DeBoer. Hey, Charlie, let's get into our aforementioned player draft on the defensive side of the ball because this might take a second. We know. We kind of got to put each other on like a 30-second clock when it comes to these selections, but as was the case on the offensive side of the ball, you're the guest here. So with that, you get the number one overall selection among the defensive players currently on campus at the University of Alabama. We'll pick 11 each. Okay. I thought you were going to take the first pick. I was fully expecting that going in, but then such a gracious. Yeah. Well, your comments earlier about how you clearly won, you got to take the last pick in that regard. So um, yeah, for me, I with the idea of me taking the first pick, I knew who I wanted immediately just because the defensive backfield is limited in experience. So I'm taking the veteran number one overall, Malachi Moore off the board. Ooh. Taking I just, the versatile DB. I just think I'm looking at quantity here and – there's not much when you look at the defensive backfield from an experience standpoint in this Alabama True. defense. So give me a guy that chose to come back for a fifth year. That's going to be a leader of this defense. I thought played really, really well last year. You know, I'm tempted to take uh, a corner here be, for the same reasons that you mentioned. Uh, just very, very little in the way of uh, documented production and certainly none really when you talk about, at the University of Alabama. So with that, I'm going to go safe. I'm going to go with my middle linebacker. I'm going to go Deontay Lawson. Uh, 
there's another guy at those inside linebacker spots that I'd feel just as good about, I think. But similar to your pick of Malachi in the secondary, uh, there are some things to figure out from a depth perspective at inside linebacker. And I'm banking on Deontay staying healthy. Yeah. Something that's certainly been an issue in, in his previous three years. And hopefully that's the case. The newly numbered number zero, Deontay yeah. Lawson, Charlie Potter. Agent zero out here. Uh, I like it. I know there's a lot of people that don't, but uh, I think it's fun. Now, I will say uh, before I make my pick, 32 at inside linebacker is a great number. I think Deontay wore it well. Uh, being a guy from Mobile who kind of grew up idolizing CJ Mosley, that was a fun story. But I also get wanting to kind of forge your own path. And um, yeah, maybe that was something Nick Saban didn't allow, this players wearing number zero. And uh, now coming back as a, a veteran, he chose to do that. So that'll be – we'll probably talk to Deontay on Wednesday, so we'll get the full story there. But with you taking Lawson, I kind of have to take Jihad Campbell for my second pick. I can't let you have both of those dudes in the middle – um, you know, you mentioned Lawson's availability. Campbell had some really bright spots this past season whenever he was kind of forced into leading that defensive group from the inside linebacker spot. And I, I think he's in for a big year. Yeah, you can't go wrong with Jihad. And I think he can play the multiple roles that you would want Deontay to handle as well on the ball, off the ball, uh, in coverage, can cover a lot of ground as we've yeah. seen from him. Uh, seems to be a really good fit for what Kane Womack wants to do on the defensive side of the ball. So with my second selection, I can't believe I'm not going with a big here. But there is there is some options. There are some options from which to choose. So I'm still I'm still thinking depth right here at particular positions. And with that, I am still going to go Keon Sab at the safety position. How about that for a guy who's just showed up in Tuscaloosa yeah. but Kind of for the reasons that you mentioned for Malachi and I went through with Deontay Lawson. Give me the Michigan transfer back there at the safety position. Think he can play free safety. Think he can play that rover spot. Maybe he could even play some Husky if you needed him to. No, I, I think it's a good pick um, because it's kind of like Malachi, that versatility you just mentioned is is valuable in a draft like this. But I also think given Kalen DeVore's comments, I think Keon's a guy that's going to be mm -hmm. all over the field, make a lot of plays. That defense kind of funnels the action to the safety. So, um, you know, taking safeties early, linebackers early, they're going to make a ton of plays this fall. And I'm kind of surprised that you went that regard because I thought you were going to go a different route. And that's what I'm going to take off the board now. We talk about limited availability. Um, there's only one cornerback coming back with any experience on this roster, but Alabama added a guy via the transfer portal uh, in um, Damani Jackson, and I'm, I'm going to take him off the board now, get what I think is the number one corner currently on the roster and put him on mine. Yeah, that was the call for me at two. Damani or Keon Sab, and typically you go corner there, I know. Uh, I, I like the security. I think Sab's going to give me on the back end. Damani certainly has a tremendous upside, maybe a little bit of a different system than what yeah. he was sold on by Nick Saban and the previous staff with what Alabama is going to be more eyes to the quarterback. But, you know, if they play field and boundary instead of left and right, this is a guy with exceptional speed. I could see him playing out to the field uh, and being a very nice piece for this Alabama defense in 2024. So with that, I am going to look to my front seven once again. I'm going to go back to the bigs, and I'm going to go Tim Smith here at the defensive line position. I think he's a guy who can play some uh, end if you need him to, strong side end. He can obviously play inside. So give me the veteran, Tim Smith, and what Tim Watts has referred to many times here on the YouTube channel. A contract year for Tim Smith. I'm going to go oh. with number 50 here. I thought you were going to say Dancing Bear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, look, I this is shaping up nice for what I had on my my big board. Here we go. Um, I thought you were going to go Tim Keenan. I heard Tim. I was like, ah, dang it. It was one of the it was yeah. one of the Tims. If I'm, I'm going, going to be honest here. I'm going Tim Keenan. I, I think mm -hmm. he had a great year last year. He's someone, too, that has quietly emerged as a leader of that group. And that's going to be big with a guy like Justin Boyd moving on. Uh, I think Keenan has 
not even gradually, it's almost been like seismically improved over the course of his career. I think this is a big year for him. If he can be a space eater in the middle of that defensive line for those linebackers that are going to be making plays, I think that's that sits up nicely for the inside of my defense. Yeah, there's depth there on that front. So I'm tempted to go back to the bigs from the tackle spot primarily. Um, and I'm uncertain about my edges. It's kind of where I'm looking right now. Need some depth, need another inside linebacker. Uh, but I'm going to take Jaheim Otis here. I don't know if it was so much a sophomore slump last season, but I'm thinking it's going to be more of a bounce back type of year for Jaheim, who changed the name, right? It's J E H E I M now, or maybe it was all along. It's J E H I E M. I E M. Yeah, he I changed it up e. completely. I before E, except for C. That's the one thing from English class <laughs> that I, I recall from middle school. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm going with uh, the big O there. And Jaheem, Jaheem Otis. Yeah, Jaheem changing his name, changing his number. He's he's changing everything up on us. And for number me, 10, I right? I mean, yeah. that's, that's that's different for a yeah. big dude. And i surprised he didn't take a single digit because those are open. Um Sometimes it's fun to see those defensive linemen in the in the single numbers there. But for me, at my next spot, I've, I've kind of taken a, a guy at every position, and I'm going to continue that trend. And while I think there's some promising young players, although they're not proven, I'm going to go with an edge rusher, and I'm going to take Quandarius Robinson off the board. Q. Yeah, um, you know he's the most experienced guy in that room. He's someone that was Alabama's third outside backer this past year. Was in that cheetah package with Dallas Turner and Chris Braswell. You know, he's a guy that I think has a lot to prove uh, this spring. Uh, I mentioned that on our roundtable discussion yesterday, just how, you know, cornerback, offensive tackle, those are obvious spots where position battles are, are going to be the focus of our discussions. But with both Dallas Turner and Chris Braswell moving on, you're going to have to have guys step up. And while I think that Q makes a ton of sense, you know, he's going to have to hold off these younger guys, guys like Keanu Coot and these uh, five-star freshmen. So I think he can. I think he's a guy that's poised to have a, a much larger role in this defense. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to take the first edge rusher off the board here. I like Q. I like him, too, for what he can do in the kicking game, special teams. Uh, he is also intangibly, I think, going to be a guy that this new staff I would think Ling's on. I mean, we'll see how spring plays out. You got some talented guys, young guys that are going to give him a push. Um, so with my fifth selection here of the 2024 spring defensive UA football player draft, I'm going to go, gosh, I'm going to go. I got to go to corner at some point. I really need to. Uh, and I'm going to go Jalil Hurley right there. I got to take a corner. I understand Zabian Brown, Zay Mincy, Jalen Mbakwe. You know, Jalil was a pretty highly sought after talent in his own right. Got a little bit of time in the program now. Feel like I got to reach a little bit here in the secondary, Charlie, with the fifth pick. So I'll go Jalil Hurley. No, I like that pick. I'm I'm interested to see what Jaleel could do a year in the program. Um, you know, I, I think we've talked about it on here. I, I talked to Justin Woodall. Uh, kind of before, um, well, obviously before spring practice started, but he worked with a lot of these guys. And and Jalil's kind of the forgotten guy in that defensive back room because we saw Tony Mitchell and Bray Hubbard play last year. Those are guys that are back, uh, but Jalil didn't. And uh, I think he's a guy that I'll be interested to see what he looks like in, in the spring, kind of where he's lined up. Uh, but he has a, a big uh, opportunity right here in front of him. So, yeah, it makes sense to go with him kind of after Damani. Those are your two. Um, veteran I guess you could say corners I'm going to go with another veteran though sticking that defensive backfield looking at kind of where things have fallen so far um you know you took key on sab I was maybe hoping not fall this far but he might still be there but I, I'm going to go with a guy like Devonte Smith mm -hmm. I think pairing him with uh Malachi Moore he's a guy that seemed like was poised for a, a big role last year but kind of got hurt before the season started didn't play much at all but uh, I think that will be big for um, you know this defense again with the 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 way that this defense kind of funnels to that safety position. A guy like Devonte can make plays in the back end, and he's a guy too. Uh, you know, we talk about Malachi and Deontay, and on the offensive side of the ball, Jalen and, and Tyler Booker. The way that they've kind of been leaders for this team. But my man Devonte has has said some stuff 
uh, whether it's via Yale, Alabama, or just social media in general, he's he's staying in on business, and I like that. And I'm gonna gonna happily add him to my defense. In line, it appeared last preseason for a significant role yeah. before the injury. So he's been in this position before, and he has positioned himself to have a role of significance, and he is versatile. So if he can stay healthy, he will absolutely be in this mix throughout spring practice, and you would think into fall camp. Again, though, talented young dudes that have uh, descended upon Tuscaloosa to go along with a couple of high-profile transfers. So I'm going to go back up front with my sixth pick, and I'm going to go LT Overton, the Texas A&M transfer. And I think maybe in some ways a little bit of a change in system could be a good thing for LT Overton. I can see him playing that bandit position, you know, kind of the other edge to your Wolf, I guess it is, at the outside linebacker position. I'm going to go LT Overton. I think his body type and, you know, the experience he does have at this level is going to be beneficial to him. Yeah, no doubt. I I think that that change of scenery is is big and, like, playing him kind of in the right role will benefit him. Uh, The way that you've kind of taken some defensive linemen off the board, uh, I'm going to have to go there now. And and I'm happy this guy fell to me at seven. I'm going to go with a guy like Jamarian Latham. I think he is a guy, too, in this defense. He's a guy that was not solely – he wasn't the only person there. But when they went with that cheetah package, a lot of times you saw a 93 out there as your lone defensive lineman. It's going to be weird now because he's in 20, another guy that changed numbers. But he was the guy that when Alabama put out his practice footage, I think like a quick less-than-a-minute clip from yesterday – First up, looks like he's added some good weight. I, I think he can be a big impact player on that defensive line. I think so, too. I think that's a, a nice mix that you're going to have there of kinds of guys like Overton, like Latham, like Jordan Renaud. We'll see yep. about Hunter Osborne, maybe Curtis Perry. I think you've got guys like that at defensive tackle. I probably went a little too early and too high for a couple of defensive tackles because you've still got some guys that played football last year and still have promising futures in front of them as well. So we're now through your seventh pick. You go to Marion Latham there. I have completed pretty much my defensive tackles and end positions with Tim Smith, Jaheim Otis, and LT Overton. And with that, I'm going to go to the Wolf position, that outside linebacker position. And at this point, I almost feel like I have to take Quay Roussel, not just because I think he's going to be a really good player, but Tim Watts has mentioned this guy no less than about six straight weeks on our shows here on the YouTube home for BamaOnline.com. So give me the Montgomery native, Quay Roussel at outside linebacker number seven. I like that. And I'm really interested to see kind of what this looks like because is are these what are formerly known as outside linebackers, I guess, are they – completely restricted to one position or can we see them work at both the wolf and the bandit that's my biggest question mark really in this defense is kind of just personnel in that defensive front because if if they are kind of just pigeonholed to one spot um you're probably going to piss some guys off and guys are going to leave after the spring yeah. if we're being completely honest so i'm interested to see if they'll work at both uh, i kind of have a feeling that we'll see a little bit of that mm-hmm. but I, I think the dynamic there is interesting and looking at what's left um Man, I could go a bunch of different ways. I am going to hmm. see. I could go Ed Rusher and get two guys, but again, yeah. are they playing both? My clock is ticking. I'm going to go. I'm going to take one of these freshman corners off the board. I'm going to kind of stick with what I kind of thought would fall this way. And a guy that I like, I I think all three of the five-star freshman corners are talented and can play in this defense. Uh, But I like a guy like Zay Mincy. I think he showed some some good things at All-American Bowl. Uh, He's a big corner. And um, I think pairing him with Damani Jackson, I think kind of can kind of solidify a secondary with Malachi Moore and, and Devontae Smith. Since you took a corner, now you've got two. So I'm not in as big a hurry. Correct. I helped you out there, Travis. At eight, but I love Zay Mincy. Yeah. And I had him sort of typed in there <laughs> in that eight spot. So I I'm still need screen a corner. Sharing. I can see yeah. what you're doing. <laughs> I need an inside linebacker. I need a corner. I need another safety. So with that, I'm going to go Justin Jefferson here at number eight. 
uh, thinking about the inside linebacker position. We're flying blind a little bit here. We're one practice in. We haven't had a media viewing period. Yeah. Uh, but just in terms of a guy that's been around at the junior college level and at Alabama, thinking about how he could fit into this system pretty well, understanding we saw him some on special teams last year. We saw him a good bit in 8A in 2023. Looked like a guy that would absolutely love collisions and play at a high speed. Now, didn't always play going the right way at a high speed, maybe. But that's where I worry about him a little bit. He probably was just settling into what everything that went into the Nick Saban defense. Now he's changing again. Um, but I'm going to go Justin Jefferson there. As much as anything, just based on, uh, I think, talent and and you know what he can do when he does have it figured out. No, I like that. Um, I think when you look beyond Deontay and um, Jihad, I, I think the inside linebacker group still has some quality players there. And uh, a guy that I think gives some kind of position flexibility, you know, I like that when we're picking this. It's kind of who I had in my mind next if you didn't go, well, regardless of what you did, uh, but I'm glad you didn't take him, is uh, Jeremiah Alexander. I think if you can have him as a guy that can play alongside Jahad Campbell in, in this defense that I have, um, that's great. You can also probably play him at one of those uh, edge rushing positions too. But he's of late, he's worked more with the um, the inside backers, and uh, I think that's kind of where he started the spring too, based off of just some initial rumblings from yesterday. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to add him to that defense with some some position flexibility. So at number nine, you go Jeremiah Alexander. It was Justin Jefferson or Jeremiah Alexander okay. for me at that extra inside linebacker position. Um, I think the fits work for both of us. I think Alexander with Campbell is is, is a nice complimentary type of duo. And I think the same with Jefferson, probably more off the ball with Deontay on it, on the middle linebacker position. Uh, and then safety or corner here, as I look at my nine and ten spots, Wow. Um, not a whole lot left at the Rover and free safety, not in terms of experience, obviously. I mean, they're talented guys. Tony Mitchell could be a guy. Um, I think Bray Hubbard could be a guy. Red Morgan, you just hear great things about in terms of how much this guy is around the football. Uh, Peyton Woodyard coming in as a highly regarded true freshman. I think for me, it comes down to Mitchell. Hubbard, Morgan, Woodyard for this safety spot. And I'm going to go, I'll go Peyton Woodyard. I'll go Peyton Woodyard as the early enrollee. Big expectations for this guy. Might be asking a little bit of a lot for him as a true freshman, but I'm going to pair him with a veteran in Keon Sab and see if we can get it done at safety. I like that pick. Um, I think of the the newcomers, I think he makes a lot of sense. He's he's the biggest of the group. But you're right about a guy like Red Morgan. Uh, heard good things about him. He's just a, a go getter. Uh, but I'm gonna go. I'm gonna stick there. Um, and kind of the guy that I had to pair with Malachi and Devonte in my mind the whole time was Tony Mitchell. And because it gives you the the option to you can play Tony in the back end at safety. You can play him down in the box at the the husky position. Um, and that allows you to kind of choose what you do with Malachi. Uh, so I'm, I like that that trio of, of kind of safety Husky uh, guys that I have, because I think all three can play the same or can play all three spots. So uh, I like that a lot. So there you go. There is Charlie Potter's 10th selection. Um, I'm going to check in at number 10. I'm going to go. Wow. What do I got left here? I've got 11 guys. I've got my middle linebacker. I've got my off-ball linebacker. I've got Tim Smith, Jaheim Otis. Um, I'm going to go Zabian Brown at corner. I'm going to go with another true freshman from SoCal. And it's interesting because we both made selections that are corner sort of oriented at this point. Four guys that we've taken off the board. And one of them to this point isn't Jalen Mbakwe, one of the highest rated recruits for Alabama for the 2024 cycle. Now he's going to be making that full-time commitment to the defensive side of the ball. So maybe we're both anticipating some growth that's going to be taking place for Mbakwe immensely skilled and talented. So it won't be a surprise if that adjustment goes quickly for him and he's, 
he's ready to go as early as this season. But for now, give me Zabian Brown, Charlie. No, I mean, I I, I like Zabian Brown too. I, I think he might have been like it was a kind of a, a coin toss between him and and Zay Mincy for me. Uh, but I, I think all three are uber talented. I wouldn't be surprised if if one of the three, any of them. Um, challenge both Damani Jackson and Angelo Hurley at that corner spot this spring. I'm really fascinated to see how that position battle will shape up because Alabama has talented options. There's just not a ton of experience. Uh, I still think that's a, a spot they might look at at the portal, but maybe one of these guys steps up and you know, you, you the impact you think Damani Jackson can make, you have a formidable duo there. But um, numbers are just low and experience is low. So for me, um, I love how this draft shaped up for me and I'm going to go, <laughs> I'm going to fill out that last kind of defensive line edge rusher spot. You, you mentioned him earlier. I'm going to go with a guy like Jordan Renaud. I think he yeah. can play that bandit spot or wolf spot, whatever, whatever I want to do with him, I guess opposite of Juan Darius Robinson have Tim Keenan, Jamarian Latham in the middle. Uh, yeah. I, I like how that defensive front shaped up. And uh, I think that, yeah, that's my 11th pick. So that's the last one for me. There you go. There is the defensive 11 picks for Charlie Potter. I'm going to round mine out with the aforementioned Red Morgan. I'm going to go with another freshman on that back end, man. I'm putting all my freshman chips into the middle of the table. I'm going to be very green on this back end, but I'm banking on some playmaking ability and some positional versatility for from Red, Charlie. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he uh, I think he's someone to keep an eye on this spring. And uh it's going to be tougher at the safety spot because you have Malachi, you have Devonte, you add in a guy like Keon Sab, you have Mitchell and, and Bray Hubbard coming back. But I, I think these freshmen, whether it's Woodyard, Red Morgan, even you know, Lil, Lil Dre coming in wearing his dad's yeah. number, I, I think that you feel better about the safety spot than you do at corner. And I think these young guys, I think they can push some of those older guys, no doubt. Yeah, I think our uh, pal C. Lewis three eight two kind of read our minds here that the selections that we made make it obvious that defensive playmakers are scarce. I don't think they're scarce, Charlie. We just, we haven't seen it from them yet. The, right. the talent and the potential is certainly there, but in terms of documented production, no doubt there's, there's little to go on. I'll say this too, looking at um, what's left, we didn't, nobody took Keanu Cook. Yeah. Nobody took Keon Keeley, Yonze Pierre, uh, on the defensive line, Damon Payne, James Smith. I think all those Edric guys Hill. Yeah, yeah. can can make contributions. The secondary, I mean, like, it's it's tough because there are a lot of young and green players, but inside linebacker has guys back. The defensive front has guys back. I think if you can figure out some of those position battles in the secondary, especially at corner, and then you can kind of solidify that, that front uh, in front of those inside backers, this defense can be really good. Uh, and I think they're going to have opportunities to make a lot of plays. It's just you got to have guys step up, and that's the case every spring. It is, and then you got to see, as you alluded to earlier, how you come out of spring from a roster perspective. Yeah. Once there's more of an indication given both ways in terms of system fits and uh, competition and depth chart placement and those kind of things. But going into the spring, now you really – really got to like this Alabama roster. I'm pretty sure uh, pretty sure it's a step up for Kalen DeBoer based on his last couple of stops and certainly did a great job at both Fresno State and the University of Washington. And you mentioned guys that, that didn't get selected, and it just points out right now anyway the kind of depth, the talent that this team has on the defensive side of the ball. All right, Charlie, as we wind things down with you here, Big one this evening down in Gainesville. The Alabama men's basketball team looking to rebound from a disappointing loss. Could be disheartening in some ways to the Tennessee Vols last Saturday night at Coleman Coliseum. Talked about this with Tim uh, and the fellas yesterday. Still felt like it was a, a big win for Alabama basketball. Just the events of the weekend, the entirety of Saturday, really from sun up to sundown. Uh, the biggest game in the sport with Alabama and Tennessee capping things, college game day. Uh, you talk about things you can't put a dollar value on if you're Nate Oates. Uh, that's the kind of day Saturday was. It was. Um, you know, I went to game day, um, you know, got to sit, I guess, the media section and be on the floor for a lot of it. It was great. Um, the atmosphere that night was great. It's, 
I, it's tough to remember a, a better home environment than that one. Uh, you had all the stars out. I know everybody points to all the football and, and the golf, uh, the golfers that were there. But I mean, it was the, the Coleman Coliseum crowd brought it. And um, I think, too, I, I know, obviously, you know, Nate's not not a moral victory guy at all, but Alabama played better defensively. And that was kind of not necessarily a surprise. But when you think about the way that they were kind of able to to keep Dalton connect and check, they took care of the basketball. And if you would have told me those two things, I'd be like, oh, Alabama won this game. But it's the offense let them down, which was the huge surprise, not just from a, a shooting standpoint. I know that's a tired narrative about Alabama, but they just couldn't buy any bucket. And the kind of from, I think, the 14 minute mark on, they, they only made three field goals the rest of the way. So that's it's tough to win any game doing that, but especially against a veteran team like Tennessee that plays well on the defensive end of the floor. So I thought it was a, a much improved effort against the Vols, who are a tough matchup for Alabama. But, uh, yeah, it, it makes this game against Florida uh, all the more important just to kind of stay in the hunt for that regular season SEC title. It's going to be it's going to be tough to do, but, you know, Nate said it best yesterday. You, you can't do it unless you win these next two. Yeah, it's a quick turnaround, too. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about going from Saturday night to a tip-off in Gainesville this evening that was actually moved up from 8 Central to 6 Central, you got a Florida team with plenty to play for in its own right. Yes, there is an outside chance still at some semblance of an SEC regular season title. But the one thing you want to try to make sure of is you take care of that double buy scenario yeah. that's out there for this team still. Florida 13 and one at Exact Tech Arena this season. The only loss, it's SEC opener against Kentucky, lost that game by two. So it's going to be a challenge. Florida smarting in its own right, coming off a road loss, a disappointing road loss at South Carolina. You know, we wonder about Latrell Wright sell still. That didn't sound encouraging yesterday. That set off some alarms for me anyway, Charlie, about the big picture, um, the uncertainty of his status. First and foremost, you're concerned for him because head injuries in any aspect of any form aren't a good thing for anybody. Uh, but as it relates to this Alabama basketball team, what what was your sense of Latrell Wright sell and his pending availability at some point? Nate didn't sound positive yesterday whenever uh, he was asked about it. Heck, I think he even mentioned Latrell just in an offhand comment before a direct question. Just and and his comment didn't give Alabama fans the warm and fuzzies talking about if we if we ever get Latrell back. I think he was being more sarcastic about that. But um, I know Alabama fans have a lot of questions about what's taking so long. And you said it with a head injury, you want to take your time with that. And, and Nate, I kind of mentioned he had a little bit of a setback, you know, he was kind of on the track to come back, but anytime you're dealing in with a, a concussion and you're in that protocol, if you have a headache the next day, you kind of go back to, to square one. And that's what happened. And I will say it was positive that Latrell was able to get some shots up before uh, the Tennessee game. He was, he was in uniform for a lot of that. Uh, he went through um, shoot around. He did some warm ups, but then when they started to do some, some team stuff, he he was kind of off to the side and was in street clothes. But he was in that loud environment on the bench. He wasn't away from it, so I think it's a, a good sign of what's to come. But I, I don't know about his availability tonight. I would kind of lean toward them not having him, and and it's going to be big for guys like Sam Walters and Davin Cosby to step up and, and Nate kind of challenged those young players because, um, you know, they need to start playing like sophomores, he said. And, um, you know, I, the, the bright spot, I think, in a lot of this is the first game that Latrell missed was the Florida game. Alabama, while it, it had to go to overtime, was able to win that game. So they're going to need those guys, Jaron Stevenson, Mo Diabate, all those young guys to step up. And it, the big thing is, they got to take some pressure off guys like Mark Sears and Aaron Estrada and even Riley Griffin, because those guys are playing a ton of minutes. And I think that kind of had an impact on this game against Tennessee, because that's a physical yep. fist fight of a game and fatigue becomes a real issue. Even though you're this late in the season, you're well conditioned when your guys are playing, you know, 38, 40 minutes against a team like Tennessee, you're going to be worn out. Yeah. Tennessee gets up into you yeah. and they like to keep trying to push you out further and further off the three-point line, make you run your offense essentially out near midcourt. That's the way Tennessee likes to play. You're right, Alabama did survive Florida last time without Latrell Wright sell, played from behind for just about all of that game. Don't know if that's sustainable on the road tonight. Yeah. 
I think the first five to eight minutes, I know you can say that about any game. What kind of start do you get off to? But I think especially tonight on the road, on senior night at UF, need to get off to as good a start as it possibly can. Alabama, I think, shot eight of 32 from three in the last meeting with Florida and was still able to score 98 points in overtime and win the game. Don't know. I think they've got to be north of 10, 12 threes made tonight, Charlie, to get it done against the Gators. Yeah, I think those double digits is is key uh, from beyond the arc. And I think a guy, um, you know, he's not been known for a shooter. Like, you need guys like Davin Cosby and Sam Walters to step up and hit some shots tonight. But I think looking at just the last matchup, you need a big game from Grant Nelson again. I know that's not really – that doesn't translate to what we were just talking about with the trail rights hole. But if Grant can, can stay on the floor, I don't think Nate was very happy with some of the calls that were um, – made against him against the, uh, in the Tennessee game. But if he can stay on the floor and uh, be productive, uh, and he has been of late, but if he can kind of duplicate what he did against ten, um, Florida the first time out, I think that could be really big for this team. But, yeah, from a beyond-the-arc standpoint, Alabama needs to, to shoot the ball well, and they can't have another offensive performance like they had in that second half against Tennessee. Did a nice job on the glass in that first go around too. So Nick yeah. Pringle, you know Sam Walter, uh, excuse me, uh, Grant Nelson had a big game. I think twenty two points, eight boards, won the hard hat against yeah. Florida. The last, that's the type of game he can't have a Tennessee game tonight. I don't think he's got to be big uh, on the glass because if you're not, Florida will eat you up on the offensive boards and Alabama did a good job of that last time around. Well, Charlie, as always, we appreciate you taking time with us here on the YouTube home for BamaOnline.com. Catch all of Charlie's great work right there with us at BamaOnline.com. And of course, when he checks in with us here on the YouTube channel, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, we certainly hope you'll do that. Hit the like button for us if you don't mind. Turn on those notifications. You'll get all of our video content as it drops right here on the YouTube home for B-O-L. Charlie, we'll do it again soon. Yeah, looking forward to it, man. Looking forward to getting out to practice this week. Yeah, yeah. Get out there tomorrow. I'm taking the old man down to Gainesville tonight. We're going to be in that Alabama-Florida game. We'll see. Nice. We'll see how he handles himself. He can be hit and miss. <laughs> he can be hit and miss. I'm going to fill him full of barbecue pregame at Adams down yeah. there in uh, Gainesville, and maybe, maybe he'll be content. We'll see. But it should be a lot of fun nonetheless. All right, Charlie. Take care. All right. See you, man. For Charlie Potter, Travis Ryder, thanking you for joining us right here on the YouTube home for BOL. And until next time, so long, everybody.